Hi, Ellie. How are you? Hello. Hi, Tatiana. Nice to be here. Oh, thank you so much for joining me. So thank you for having me. Before uh, before I switched on the recording, we were speaking about this the subject, which is I guess is very close to all of our hearts, our parents, or aunties and uncles, is um, how we are being and how our being affects our children. You know, you, you, and, and there is also an aspect of vulnerability in that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what I'm thinking about right now is the, the challenge we have in work and as coaches around the doing versus the being and then how that shows up as parents and in this, you know, achievement uh, focused culture. Um, at least here in America, <laughs> um, you know, how do we role model for our kids being it, and, and how that's as important or more important. Um, and that does take vulnerability, right? And, and I mean, there's all sorts of vulnerabilities that show up for us as parents if we want to, but that does, right? Because that can mean letting down the, our own needs to, to achieve you know, and our own connection with that, the doing and letting our kids in this generation and future generations know like it's okay to just be. Yeah. Have the conversations with people sometimes, either my own clients in my therapy practice, my coaching practice, or even with my, my older child who's 17 about just sort of doing nothing. And what does that mean? And every so often, I mean, it's really not it's probably a couple minutes a week, right? But I'm just staring out my kitchen window at the bird feeder. Or, you know, there was one time a couple of years ago, we were leaning over a rock wall in California, looking at the seals on the beach. And he's like, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. This just came to me. Like, I'm looking at the ocean. I'm looking at the birds. Like, how do you, how do you, right? And this yeah. achievement driven and tech driven era, you know, it's just like absolutely foreign to him. Yes. So exactly. Yeah. I, I, I love it. What does it actually mean of doing nothing, right? Right. And 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 there is like this drive in in achieving and striving because even even in doing meditation, it's still doing meditation, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And this is, this is actually a very important topic. You know, it's just reminding me of another conversation with a young man, a musician, a very, very successful musician um, who I was speaking with. And we were talking about what do you want to create? I said, well, what do you want to spend your time doing? And right off the top of his head, one out of the three things he said was thinking. And I thought, oh, that's just brilliant, right? Because we don't slow down enough to just think mm. and for me when i think about that that's just sort of nuts <laughs> like if we don't have that pause to just think and just or not even think just to be in our own bodies but but just to think it's hard to be calm it's hard to be collected it's so yeah and, and there is thinking and thinking because thinking about a solution or thinking about a particular problem or thinking about a particular plan, it's still thinking with a goal or achievement in mind, right? Right. Just thinking and, and let your thought go wherever it yeah. is. Right. And yet I straight away, you know, get a little bit of the dilemma or paradox in that. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, 
it's nice, it's, it's very important to learn how to just be, right? But, but, but isn't it a privilege or, of having already quite an established life, established um, financial position? Mm -hmm. Do I really just um, tell my girls, oh, just be, mm -hmm. right? So, so mm -hmm. because, and, 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 and I think it's almost too late, <laughs> but, you know, in terms of, you know, they, they're already striving too much. But then, um, it, I, I mean, I mean the, the, the security and safety, which is such an important need for humans, right? And also fulfillment. How, how does it happen from just being? Yes, right. And, and, right. And socioeconomic level and culture and all those pieces definitely enter into it. So we're looking at our approach to that through our own lens of what we have the privilege of having, perhaps, right? Um, right, I, I, you and I were also just talking about how emotional intelligence is ad flexible and adaptable and how, I mean, one of the things I find so exciting with all this is just fairly recently, right, in the history of humans in neuroscience, we've learned how adaptable the brain is, right? So it's so exciting that we can learn these things, right? Whether it's empathy or self-care or um, any of the emotional intelligence skills and tools. And I know what you mean, like, oh, is it too late? Like, what about like most of their growth is before the age of six, <laughs> but I also think it's never too late because of that exact point that um, that this stuff is moldable and and adaptable and but having that relationship with our kids, you know, like we do with our clients, but having that connection and that relationship where they're willing to enter into that conversation about these things, especially the the ages of our kids, right? Like just being able to have that connection with them and hoping that we have that connection with them so that they can listen and understand and hear when we try to talk about these different things or model it. Um, uh, I find it fascinating how they are mirroring uh, something that we might not even recognize in ourselves. Yeah. yeah. You know, we yeah. were just talking about how I think both of our kids are quite... Um, time focused and focused yeah. on um, implementing all these wonderful habits of uh, even meditation or vision right. boards. And, and, and I'm looking at that and thinking, yes. well, actually I was never like that at that age. Uh -huh. So that must uh -huh. be not me. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, yes, you right. Who's to, who is it? Am I to blame? Maybe I'll blame that one on the other, the other parent, right? <laughs> well, it's true right it, it's uh, something my daughter's 11 and so we you know we've been talking about money for a long time but she's becoming more and more conscious and I always thought that my mom taught me this great skill at about her age which was to budget right simple but you know and she said well here's your your allowance for clothes for the month and I really stuck to that. And I learned it at a young age, you know, how to write a check and things like that. And, um, and I can remember there was one year, it must have been around that age, and I, I couldn't figure out how I could get a coat. I think it was a coat or shoes out of that budget. And this really stood out for me for some reason. So I still remember, you know, 40 some years later. And, and my mom said, well, of course, that's, of course, you can get a coat. That's not in the budget. And anyway, I was learning about budget. So it made me careful. And there were other factors, I'm sure, around how I became sort of a, more of a thrifty person. But I always, up until fairly recently, I just thought that's such a great skill that my mother taught me at a young age. But now I'm seeing it play out in my daughter and she's going overboard where every little, you know, we're buying some pens on Amazon that are $10 or whatever it is. Oh, is that too expensive? And just sort of that overly like overly cautious to some degree, overly worried. And so there's that, just that balance and the, you know, around that modeling. That's yes. just a little example, but 
they're picking up on this stuff and absorbing it all the time and we don't necessarily know how it's coming through. Hey. Uh, yeah. Exactly, because it's it's exactly it's much more modeling rather yeah. than just what we say, you know. Because um, I can I go now to my girls and say, "Oh, just relax," you know. Um, right. If I could, I would. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but obviously yeah. there is modeling, and it might be it for them. They haven't observed it in me in this um, creating a visual boards or mm -hmm. but, but they observed it in some other things, right? And then and then they pick up all those features from our partners and ourselves, right? And then well, and then they yeah. just call this mirror. Yes. Right, right. It's a it's a huge responsibility as parents. <laughs> yeah. I you know I I started out in high school, my first psychology class, and from there I was hooked and I was just so interested in human behavior, you know, why do people do what they do? And then went on to psychology in college and then went on to become a social worker, wanting to help people and also so intrigued by why people do what they do. And something along the lines there very early on was reading about, you know, parenting and how to be a good parent. And it was something about, you know, teach your kids through your own mistakes that it's okay to make mistakes. Right. And you and I were also just chatting about the drive in many women and men, but we were talking about women with this perfectionist attitude and, you know, I've got to do it all and I've got to do it all right. And we've all been talking about this for decades, but it's still so, um, it's not innate. I don't know that it's innate, but it's in there from a young age. And so something I, I just read early on in my, in my career and in my life, you know, it's okay to make mistakes and you need to show your kids that from a young age. And so I thought, oh, phew, that's let me off the hook, <laughs> you know, and, but I truly believe that is so important. And then when we can say to ourselves, okay, let's make sure we role model this for our kids. And it's just, we're getting so much out of that too. Right. Cause then we can say a little bit, you know, not all the time, but a little bit like, it's okay. I guess I, I can screw up sometimes and it, it's okay. I can apologize or I can correct it, or maybe I can't and it's not the end of the world. And, uh, mm. that's role modeling too. Yes. So, and it takes quite a lot of vulnerability in this, in, in truly, you know, and, and mistake, mistake that really like, you know, not, that really almost hurts inside, you know, and mm -hmm. then then it's proper vulnerability, right? So because if it's if it doesn't if it doesn't really hurt to admit something, right? right it's probably not um, not that meaningful, you know? Right, right, right. Well, we were talking a little bit about timing, and I'm lousy with timing, and my kids, I can't hide it from them. I mean, it's it's very obvious. And I'll say I'll be there in a second, and I'm there in 20 minutes because I answered some emails or whatever, you know. And I'm sure that hurts them sometimes, certainly the younger one. And I, I say, I, I'm trying, <laughs> I'm trying, uh, you know, I'm trying. You've made me better, right? They make us better people, usually. Um, and do the best you can. Ellie, I love what you say about time because it's the same way, it's the same dynamic in my family. So my husband is always on time. My children are mostly always on time, especially younger one and older one. Uh, but I'm, I, I really struggled with time uh, for ages. Huh. So um, I exactly right. So I start doing something last moment and then it goes longer. And you know, and actually, you know, recently I've been thinking of, of this concept of Einstein time, right? Yeah. Because on one hand, so it's it's we take as much time as we need mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then what i'm creating by putting myself under such pressure because of right. course you know when i'm thinking even when you were discussing that uh, telling the story how you like oh yes i will be there in five minutes but actually you're there in 20 minutes it sounds so familiar and actually what comes to me is i'm almost creating for being told off yes 100%. Why do we need to create that? Why do we create that stress and that tension and that, then that feeling of I'm not doing it well enough? Yeah. And we can, 
I mean, again, this is something I've definitely, I have at least a handful of women right now that I'm working on it with. So we're teaching what we most need to know, right? And so hopefully, yeah, working on that a little bit through our own work with people. Yes. Yeah. Right. So that's emotional intelligence skill of self-awareness, right? Comes back to that. Just trying to be aware, look at ourselves, see where we can grow. Yeah, because with this concept of time, I have been, you know, when people say, oh, is it uh, you're late because it could it be because you don't respect other people's time? And it doesn't oh. actually resonate with me. I'm like, no, I actually do. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and what came to me, it's actually, it's, it's what about respect for ourselves, right? Yes, much more so. I, I feel that. I definitely feel that. Right. Respect for ourselves. So, yeah, because what if we gave ourselves enough time? Mm -hmm. That's right. What if we just didn't try to put three other things in an unreasonable amount of time? Wouldn't that be okay? Exactly. Because so it's so interesting how this all ties in together, isn't it? That's right. That's right, because we were speaking about also our to-do lists or to-do lists of our clients. Mm -hmm. And when people define themselves by how much um, they have on their to-do list, like, you know, like this example right. that you said that there are the people sometimes, some friends meet up and ask, ask you, oh, have you been busy recently at work? <laughs> yep. So maybe our, our commitments to ourselves right now has to be to uh, practice this, it being okay to just do the thing we were going to do and not three more things or, you know, the dinner time or end of the day, how was your day, you know, between family members, not having to think, oh, well, let me see how many things I got done and then I'll tell you how my day was, <laughs> right? Maybe we have to really, really uh, practice that. Yes, and maybe maybe it is in the secret of having this being time, you know. Mm -hmm. But being maybe day is defined not by to do list, but actually, was there any time? Yes. To be truly present yeah to each moment right i like that yeah how do you how do you define your day yeah yeah what if we yes. define our day not by achieving and striving but by how good we were at being mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like some of the amazing spiritual leaders. <laughs> I just like, you know, uh, as soon as you say it, I, I have like, wow, I have a long way to go. <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing that, and this is for everybody, it's a simple thing that's helped me. You know, it used to be that I'd get up and I, my, the one thing in my morning routine that I've had for, forever that doesn't change is I have a cup of tea you know and sometimes I actually get out of bed because I'm craving that cup of tea and uh in the past six eight months I've started a just 10 minute through the calm app mm -hmm. uh meditation and I had to go through a few different ones before I found it love this woman's voice uh Tamara Levitt I think she's one of the producers of it it's 10 minutes and I don't do it every day, even though that's my goal. But now I get, I wake up and I look forward to that. Like mm -hmm. I really crave it. And it's 10 minutes. Mm. And I, I, sometimes I forget, I get distracted with the kids or whatever it might be, but 10 minutes, sometime in that first hour, right? And it does, it's very calming. And it's just, if I just have to count, that's, 
fine. It's okay. I don't have to be doing anything else. And what a great feeling that is. Mm. And I close the doors and everybody knows, don't bother me. I get really irritated if it's interrupted, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So it's an important practice. And I know it's sort of catchy now. It's out there in the literature, the self-help literature, you know, meditation. But I say to people, I went to a training a few years ago, and the guy training on meditation said, start with three minutes. And I'm in the audience going, okay, I know why he's doing this. Really? Three minutes? He said, people come to me all the time, and they say, I can't even sit down for 20 minutes and meditate. It's like, well, of course you can. We can't even... We can't even think about trying to clear our brains for that long, even let alone doing mm. it. Mm. And I don't clear my brain even for those three minutes. But that practice of just sitting still, doing nothing else, being okay with that, and just watching my thoughts go, come back. Yeah. It's powerful. So important to, to take time for that self-care and also understanding what actually does it for you. Um, that's that, that's where it's self-awareness starts then, because how can we give to others and feel for others when we haven't taken care of ourselves and when when we are running on empty right yep yeah so i'm excited to work with more women around that balance of high achieving having an impact having a big mission a big dream and and putting themselves first. Oh, what a paradox there. Like, I'm all about the and. Yeah, yeah. So that's most of what life is, right? I mean, it's all in the gray area. It's not black or white. So from, from my point of view. Yeah. So that's exciting stuff. I, I totally agree with you, Ellie. It's, uh, it's, starting, it's starting with this place of putting yourself first, you know, because there's a paradox in this, definition of what is selfish and actually selfish is not taking care of ourselves yes because then we might be defining our happiness for someone or seeking to define happiness for someone else or for some external acknowledgement but actually right. when we start with ourselves then we can relate to others right Right. We really, I really truly believe from my own experiences and from people that I've worked with over the years, you really aren't good to anybody else if you don't have some level of self care, good level, much of the time, even yeah. if it's not all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because I was, I, I was speaking to one of my clients, and, and basically, it's so difficult to. To remember what actually we need, what we individually need, right? Mm -hmm. When we ask somebody, okay, so what actually, what did you feel in that situation? And actually, mm -hmm. with that feeling, what, which of your needs do you think were not sa satisfied or addressed? And, and then from that place, and actually, have you expressed your needs? Well, uh, but I assumed they understood. Sorry, right. but, but how? But you know, look how long it took us to understand what actually you need. Mm -hmm. How someone else can understand what you need? They yes, probably... that's a great point. Right, yeah. right. How do we? How do we somehow think people are mind readers? People are going to know. People are going to think that you. They know because your needs are the same as theirs. Right. We all do this. I do it too, but it's very valuable. Yeah. To stop and think about that. So st it's taking time on ourselves to you know what is traditionally defined as selfish by selfish. self, you know? right. but actually, actually when we are clear on our needs, when we can ask for our needs, mm -hmm. you know, without, without blame or without guilt, just like expressing them, because it's a gift when somebody expresses to me their needs. Right, right. I mean, it really, it, it takes a burden off of you. Now you're in a position where you say, okay, now I know. Now I can figure out how to meet that need. Yeah, I can decide yeah. whether I want to meet the need or not. Right, right. We can have, we can have the conversation, right? And right. I can tell you what are my needs. 
Do you know, that's like kind of, if somebody is vulnerable enough to tell me their needs, it opens also the opportunity for me to be vulnerable and to say my needs. And we both can decide whether we are okay to meet each other's needs. Yeah, absolutely. It's that right. simple and that complicates it, right? That's right. It is both, isn't it? I'm working on a program for for women around these issues. And I had this aha, I was on a bike ride last week and was having all these ahas. And I thought, oh my gosh, I, am I going to stop and pull out my cell phone or I just have to retain this until I get home and I write it down. And this idea of selfish versus self-full, which yeah. isn't even a word, but I'm making it a word. And what is that? And I want to play with that. Um, because as you're saying, let's redefine what selfish means. It really does set us up for disaster. Yes. Yeah. I love it. Selfful. Yes. It's a very great, great expression. Uh, Ellie. Exactly. Because even empathy starts with self-empathy. How can yes. we be truly empathetic for someone without having empathy for ourselves? Right. And also what I feel when, when we don't think of our own needs and don't define them, then we almost expect others to meet our needs and then we become upset when they're not mad. So do you know? Yeah, when we figure out our own and we know what they are and we know what's fulfilled and what's missing, then we're in charge. And I, I feel so strongly about that going back to, you know, the parenting issue, right? It's, I feel so strongly teaching my own kids about self, responsibility and what you're talking about here yeah how what do i need how do i get that met and and the and the less you take your own responsibility for that even even if it's not conscious i think what you're saying is you then uh, sort of unconsciously uh project that onto others to take care of that for you yeah right which just it's not fair and it, it doesn't work yeah, I think it works. And, and you know, on the subject of uh, children, because you know how often it's also, it's like understanding our needs and expressing them, but also uh, being responsible, as you say, for our own feelings, but not for feelings of others. So I was experiencing okay. it, you know, with children, uh, yeah. do, do, do you know, when they are, uh, say, feeling sad or feeling yeah. unhappy, as a mother, my, like, you know, I almost get this pain inside. I want to make it better. And, and then now I stop myself and I think, well, actually, it's their feeling. Yes. What if I accept it, that they yeah. are okay to feel how they are feeling? I'm not right. responsible for that. Right, right, right. And how that's, that's actually serving them. Yeah. But it is a, it's a dilemma. Yeah. Because you feel it. You can't help but feel it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But having, again, that self-awareness, I suppose, to say, wait a minute, let me have a little, just a little bit of detachment because that's yours. Yeah. 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 That's quite a skill. We'll, we'll be, we'll all be working on that. As yeah. our kids get into their twenties and thirties and 40s. exactly, exactly. Okay. So developing this muscle of understanding when we are triggered and what is ours and what is theirs. So interesting to me as we're talking about this that I find all of this ties in so closely together. I mean, what just came up for me was this question of boundaries and and setting boundaries, and then that sort of ties back into the you know what are my boundaries with my time, right and what are my boundaries with how much I have to do versus how much I get to be and how much I do for myself versus everybody else. And I mean, it just all, it all sort of intertwines, I think. Yeah. Um, wow. So we all have to come back to the idea, I guess, of having enough space to just be, to sort all this stuff out, <laughs> to have greater and growing self-awareness so we can be our best you know, be the best selves that we can be. Yes. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed this conversation so much, like of 
So, you know, dilemma of being versus doing, having enough time versus not enough, to-do list versus just be, and then my needs, their needs. There is like a paradox in everything, right? Everything. I know. It's fascinating. Thank you so much for this time. I've so, I really enjoyed talking with you. Oh, great. Thank you.